Hello everyone, welcome to this lecture. Just to recap, uh, in the last lecture we have uh, seen the syntax of public encryption scheme. So, the roadmap for this lecture is as follows. In this lecture we will see a candidate public encryption scheme namely Elgamal public key crypto system and we will prove formally its CPA security and we will end the lecture with some of the implementation issues which we face while implementing Elgamal encryption scheme in practice. So, let us try to understand the intuition of Elgamal encryption scheme. So, for that recall the Diffie Hellman key exchange protocol and for simplicity assume we are considering a multiplicative cyclic group. So, the public parameter is the description of a cyclic group, a generator and the size of the group which is Q and the Diffie Hellman key exchange protocol basically say Sita and Ram they want to agree upon a key, each of them pick up their own contribution for the overall key. So, Sita picks her contribution g to the power alpha as alpha is her contribution and she sends g to the power alpha to Ram and independently Ram picks his contribution beta and says sends g to the power beta and the overall key that is agreed upon k between the sender and the receiver is g to the power alpha beta. And we had formally proved the security of the Diffie Hellman key exchange protocol. So, so now consider the following encryption process. So, sender and receiver first runs an instance of the Diffie Hellman key exchange protocol to obtain a shared key when denoted by a little k which is a group element and we know that if the DDH assumption holds in the underlying group that means if the DDH problem is difficult to solve in the underlying group then the agreed key k is indistinguishable from any random element of the group. Now imagine Ram has a message say plain text m which is a group element which it wants to encrypt and send it to Sita. So, what Ram can do is from the viewpoint of Ram, Ram knows that by running the Diffie Hellman key exchange protocol, Sita is also going to have the same key k. And Ram also knows that if there is an eavesdropper who has eavesdropped the communication between Sita and Ram, then from the viewpoint of that adversary, the key k which is available with Ram is kind of indistinguishable from any random element for the group. So, what Ram can do is to encrypt the plain text m, it can use the key to mask it plain text and since we are performing operations in the group to mask the plain text what Ram can do is it can compute, it can perform the group operation O on the message and the key K and the result is denoted by C which is also sent as part along with the message which Ram would have sent as part of the Diffie Hellman key exchange protocol. Right? Now, once Sita receives the messages from Ram. So, she is now receiving two elements from the group. The first element is Ram's contribution as part of the Diffie Hellman key exchange protocol which Sita uses to generate the key k as per the steps of the Diffie Hellman key exchange protocol. And so once it has received the key k to decrypt the cipher text what Sita has to do is she has to just cancel out the effect of key k or she has to unmask the key k. And to unmask the key k what she can do is she can just perform the group operation on the cipher text c and the multiplicative inverse k multiplicative inverse of the element k. So, since element k is known to Sita and she knows the group description she can compute the multiplicative inverse in polynomial time which I denote by k inverse and if she perform the operation group operation on the cipher text c and k inverse the effect of k and k cancels out and Sita ends up getting the plain text m. Now, I claim here that the cipher text c which is the group operation on the plain text and the key k is going to be independent of the underlying plain text m. I will prove this very soon, but for the moment assume that this claim is true. Now, if indeed this claim is true then this whole protocol, this whole process of encryption and decryption indeed looks like a candidate encryption scheme because if the distribution of the cipher text C is independent of the key K then even after seeing the cipher text C this adversary is unable to figure out what exactly is encrypted in C whether it is an encryption of M0, M1, M2 it cannot figure out. So, that is the overall intuition of the Elgamal encryption scheme. So, I have retained the blueprint of the encryption scheme that I had discussed in the last slide. Now, the question is that how we can visualize the entire process that we have discussed just now as an instantiation of public key encryption scheme. 
because remember as per the syntax of public key encryption scheme, we need to have a key generation algorithm which should output the public key secret key pair, we should have an encryption algorithm and we should have a decryption algorithm. So, pictorially we know that now we have a blueprint of an encryption process, but now we have to put everything into the framework of a public into the syntax of public key encryption process. And this process of visualizing the above encryption process as an instance of public key encryption scheme was identified by uh, Tahir El Gamal and that is why this encryption process that we are going to discuss now is called an is called as is called an uh, is called as El Gamal encryption scheme. So, you might be wondering that how exactly is different from this uh, defilement key exchange protocol. Well, we are not doing anything apart from defilement key exchange protocol. So, this part of the communication which I have highlighted is exactly defilement key exchange protocol, but on top of that we are doing some additional communication from the sender side which allows the receiver to decrypt the cipher text and recover back the plain text. So, what we are going to do is the entire encryption process that we have discussed till now visually we can imagine it as an instance of public key encryption scheme as follows. So, we can imagine that uh, the receiver's message here namely Sita's message as part of the diffie hellman key exchange protocol is her public key. And we can visualize that is as if that is her contribution for the diffie hellman key exchange protocol with every potential sender once for all. That means, the key setup algorithm that Sita can run here is as follows, she can as part of secret key she can randomly pick an index alpha in the range 0 to q minus 1 and she can make her public key to be g to the power alpha and we it will be ensured that that is an authenticated copy. That means, indeed this is g to the power alpha generated by so called Sita, how exactly it is ensured we will see or solve that problem later on, but for the moment assume that Sita has generated a secret key like that and she has computed public key to be g to the power alpha and made her available in the public and made it available in the public domain. Then we can imagine as if this is her contribution or her part of the message for the diffie hellman key exchange protocol with every possible RAM who would like to do a secure communication with Sita. Right? Now, Assume we have a so called RAM or a sender who wants to encrypt a plain text say little m using the public key. So, what RAM is going to do is RAM is going to pick a random beta and the range 0 to q minus 1 and now he is going to compute two group elements. The first group element is C1 which is nothing but g to the power beta and the second group element C2 is basically the group operation m a uh, group operation be performed on the plain text and the key little k which is where the little key k is where the key little k is g to the power alpha times beta which is obtained by raising the public key u to the index beta. So, the two messages or the two elements which Ram is sending can be visualized as follows. The first message you can interpret as if it is Ram's contributions or center's contribution for the diffie hellman key exchange protocol because if indeed Ram would have participated in an instance of the diffie hellman key exchange protocol. C1 is the message which Ram would have sent to Sita in response to the message g to the power alpha which Sita has already sent and went offline. The second message C2 or the second group element C2 you can imagine as if it is the masking of the plain text with the resultant diffie hellman key which Sita and Ram would have agreed upon using g to the power alpha and g to the power beta as the protocol transcript. So, now if we imagine this encryption process by parsing the messages from say Sita and Ram like this, then it automatically fits into the framework of our public key encryption process. To do the decryption what Sita has to do is from the first group element which Ram has sent using that and the public key that Sita has sent already to the so called Ram, Sita can perform her steps of the diffie hellman key exchange protocol and agree upon or retain the same key k which Ram has used for masking the message and once it recovers the key k to decrypt the cipher text it takes the second component of the cipher text namely C2 and it performs the group operation on C2 and the multiplicative inverse of k to recover back the plain text. And my claim here is that in this entire process the distribution of the second component of the overall cipher text namely C2 is independent of the underlying plain text. So, we will soon prove this fact. But now if we 
imagine this whole thing like the way I have said now you can see that we have now an instance of a public key encryption scheme. So, now let us put the exact formal details of the Ilgamal encryption process. So, the plain text space and the public key space are both going to be the group and the secret key is going to be z, z sub q namely it is going to be the set 0 to q minus 1 and the overall cipher text will consist of two group elements. So, it is going to be a pair uh, of elements from the underlying group. The key generation algorithm outputs a public key and secret key as follows. The secret key is a random alpha in the range 0 to q minus 1 and the public key is g to the power alpha. So, that is you can imagine as if Sita is doing her part of the Elgamal, uh, her part of the uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol with every potential receiver once for all. The encryption algorithm which Ram is or any sender is going to follow for encrypting a plain text is as follows. The sender is going to pick a random beta in the range 0 to q minus 1 and compute g to the power beta that is going to be the first component of the cipher text and the actual encryption of the message is the group operation performed on the plain text and public key raised to the power beta. So, pictorially you can imagine that the first component of the cipher text is nothing but uh, sender's contribution for the Diffie-Hellman key which sender and receiver are going to agree upon and the second component of the cipher test is the masking of the plain text with that Diffie-Hellman key. Now, the decryption operation is you receive a cipher text consist of two group elements right. So, you first compute the Diffie-Hellman common key which is going to be established between the sender and the receiver by raising the group element C1 to the secret key so that you also obtain g to the power alpha beta, find the multiplicative inverse of it and perform the group operation with the second component of the cipher text so that the effect of g to the power alpha beta vanishes and you end up with the plain text. So, that is the formal syntax of the Elgamal encryption scheme. Now, we want to prove formally that this Elgamal encryption scheme is indeed COA secure. As we have discussed in the last lecture in the public key world, COA security, single message CPA security and multi message CPA security are all equivalent. So, it suffice to just prove the COA security of this encryption process. So, now as I am claiming over the last few slides, the distribution of the cipher text component C2 namely the group operation M with the Diffie-Hellman key K is going to be independent of the underlying plain text. That means, from the viewpoint of a computationally bounded adversary, if it sees C2, then it from its viewpoint it could be an, um, it could be any M group operated uh, of a, and uh, any key and the group operation being performed on that M and that key. And if that is the if that is the case, that means if this claim is indeed true, then it automatically implies COA security intuitively because for each instance of the encryption algorithm in this Elgamal encryption scheme, the sender is going to pick beta randomly right. It is not the case that it will pick the same beta every, every time and if beta is picked independently for each instance of the encryption, then it automatically means that the Diffie-Hellman key k which is used for masking the message is also going to be independent for each instance because the overall Diffie-Hellman key is g to the power alpha times beta. So, even if the alpha component in the resultant Diffie-Hellman key which sender and receiver are using to do the encryption and decryption is same, it is the beta component which is triggering the randomness here. And since beta is independently picked here for each instance of the encryption, the overall key Diffie-Hellman key k which is used in each instance is independent. And now assuming that this claim is true, that is that means the distribution of C2 is independent of the underlying plain text, we get the COA security. So, now let us formalize this intuition by a rigorous proof and to before going into the proof, let us do a warm up here and consider a variation of Elgamal encryption scheme namely uh, we are going to consider a perfectly secure uh, variant of the Elgamal encryption scheme. I stress here that it is not the way we are going to implement the Elgamal encryption scheme and or that is not the way we actually use Elgamal encryption scheme. This uh, variation of the Elgamal encryption scheme with in the private key setting is just to make the proof simpler. So, the modified Elgamal encryption scheme in the private key setting I am denoting as pi tilde. It has its own key generation algorithm, encryption algorithm and decryption algorithm. The public parameters are the cyclic group, group description 
and a uniformly random g to the power group element g to the power alpha where alpha is not known. So, we can imagine as if it is some kind of setting which uh, setup which has been done by a trusted third party and alpha is not known to anyone. Now, since this is a symmetric key encryption process, the key generation algorithm is going to output a uniformly random key and the key is an element of the group. To encrypt a message in this variant of Elgamal encryption process, uh, we compute two group elements namely C1 and C2 where C1 is some g to the power beta where beta is randomly chosen from the set Z sub Q and a ciphertext, uh, ciphertext component C2 is basically the masking of the message with the key k. Since it is a symmetric key encryption scheme, we are going to use the same key k for decryption as well and to recover the plain text, we basically take the second component of the cipher text and perform the group operation with respect to the multiplicative inverse of the key. Now, notice that in this member variation of the Elgamal encryption process, the first component of the cipher text namely C1 and the publicly known u they are not at all used for the encryption process and for the decryption process, but I am just retaining them to ensure that uh, the overall syntax of the cipher text that we are getting here looks like the same as we are going to obtain in the real instantiation of the Elgamal encryption scheme. Now, I claim here that the scheme that this variant of the uh, this uh, per private key a variant of the Elgamal encryption process is perfectly secure if my underlying plain text is the group G. And this is because this uh, private key variant of the Elgamal encryption scheme is exactly similar to the one time pad scheme over the group G. The only difference is that in the one time pad scheme we perform the XOR of the key with the plain text, but since we are in the group setting we are going just replacing that XOR operation by the group operation. More formally, Assume that we have an arbitrary cipher text say C1 comma C2 and say we consider a pair of arbitrary plain text namely M0 and M1 which are group elements because here my group uh, here my plain text space is the underlying group. I am going to show that indeed this encryption process satisfies the definition of perfect secrecy. Namely consider the probability that this arbitrary cipher text C1 comma C2 is an encryption of the plain text M0. And in the same way consider the probability that this arbitrary cipher text C1 comma C2 is an encryption of M1. It turns out that this arbitrary cipher text C1 comma C2 is an encryption of M0 only if key generation algorithm would have produced a key which is the group operation performed on C2 and the multiplicative inverse of F0. But since the key generation algorithm outputs uniformly random elements from the group as the key, it turns out that the key generation algorithm indeed outputs a key which is same as C2 group operation M0 inverse is 1 over the group size. Now, by running the exactly the same argument, we can claim that the probability that the plain text little m1 is encrypted in the cipher text C1 comma C2 is exactly the same that my key generation algorithm outputs a key which is same as the group operation performed on C2 and M1 inverse and the probability that my key is this is 1 over the size of the group. That means for any adversary even if it is computationally unbounded if it participates in an in, in a perfectly indistinguishability experiment in the symmetric key setting or the COA experiment then the probability that it can distinguish apart whether it is seeing an encryption of the group element M0 or whether it is seeing an encryption of the group element 1 is exactly half. That means, you cannot distinguish apart with equal probability it is an encryption of M0 as well as an encryption of M1 and that is why this modified or very uh, symmetric key variant of the Elgamal encryption process is perfectly secure. Now, let us turn to the COA security of the actual Elgamal encryption scheme that we have designed in the public key setting. So, before going further let us again uh, remember what we have proved just now. So, we have considered the variant of Elgamal encryption scheme in the symmetric key setting and here is the encryption algorithm. The encryption algorithm consists of it produces two group elements C1, C2 where C1 is some random g to the power beta and C2 is the masking of the message and apart from that the adversary also have a public information namely g to the power alpha where alpha is not known to the adversary. So, if I consider the view of the adversary, the adversary's view basically consists of 
three probability distributions or namely he has a element g to the power alpha where alpha is randomly chosen from z q. It knows the value of g to the power beta where beta is randomly chosen from z q and it knows the masking of the message with the plain text where the key is chosen randomly from the underlying group. And we have proved that this encryption process is perfectly secure. On the other hand the actual Elgamal public key encryption scheme that we have designed there also the ciphertext consists of two group elements and the ciphertext second component of the ciphertext is the masking of the message with the Diffie Hellman key namely g to the power alpha beta. So, if I consider the adversary's view in this real instantiation or the actual instantiation of the Elgamal encryption scheme in the public key setting then its view is as follows it knows the value of g to the power alpha where alpha is unknown and uniformly random from the set z q. It knows the value of g to the power beta where beta is uniformly random from the set z q and it knows the masking of the message with a Diffie Hellman key where the Diffie Hellman key is nothing but g to the power alpha beta and it belongs to the underlying group. Now, if you see cl here closely what exactly is dif differing here if I consider the views of the two adversary here. The distribution of g to the power alpha in both the worlds or for both the adversaries are perfectly the same or they are exactly indistinguishable. Here also alpha is random, here also alpha is random not known to the adversary and adversary knows the value of g to the power alpha. In the same way the distribution of g to the power beta for in both the worlds are exactly identical. What is differing here is the nature of C2 that adversary sees in the symmetric key variant of Elgamal scheme and the distribution of C2 which adversary sees in the actual Elgamal encryption scheme. In the symmetric key world the masking is with a uniformly random group element little k whereas in the public key Elgamal the masking of the plain text is with a pseudo random key k which is a, a Diffie Hellman key g to the power alpha beta. And if I assume that the DDH assumption holds in my underlying group then we know that as per the Diffie Hellman assumption uh, Diffie Hellman triplet and a non help Diffie Hellman triplet they are computationally indistinguishable from the viewpoint of any computationally bounded adversary. That means if my k is uniformly random that means if I am in this case then that k is some g to the power gamma where gamma is totally random not related to alpha and beta. Whereas if I consider a uh, ciphertext C2 as per the public key Diffie Hellman key exchange uh, as per the public key Elgamal encryption scheme then my k little uh, my key little k is nothing but g to the power alpha beta. So, if my adversary cannot distinguish between a Diffie Hellman triplet and an, uh, it cannot distinguish between a DH triplet and a non DH triplet then I can say that the distribution of the ciphertext component C2 which adversary sees in both the worlds are also computationally indistinguishable. And that will automatically prove that our Elgamal encryption process is COA secure. So, that is the formal statement which we are going to prove now. We are going to prove that if the DDH assumption holds in my underlying group then the Elgamal encryption process is indeed COA secure. And we formally establish this fact by giving a reduction. So, assume you have a polytime adversary who can attack your Elgamal public key encryption scheme. Now, using that attacker we are going to design a DDH solver a polytime DDH solver who can distinguish apart a Diffie Hellman triplet from a non Diffie Hellman triplet. So, it participates in an instance of the DDH experiment. The DDH experiment prepares a challenge for the DDH solver by giving him a u v k where u and v are random group elements and the third component of the triplet is either uh, g to the power alpha beta or it is a uniformly random element g to the power gamma depending upon whether the challenger has b equal to 0 or b equal to 1. And the task of the DDH solver is whether it is a DDH triplet, DH triplet or a non DH triplet. To solve that the DDH solver invokes our attacker who can attack the Elgamal encryption scheme and participates in an instance of the COA game and it sets up the public key to be u, it sets public key to be u. Now, as per the rules of the COA game the COA attacker will submit a pair of challenge plain text from the underlying group and this DDH solver is going to randomly choose one of those two messages 
and it prepares the challenge cipher text as follows. The second component of the triplet which is given as a challenge to this DDH solver is set to be the first component of the cipher text and the actual encryption of the message is set as m sub b um, masked with the third component of the triplet which is thrown as a challenge to the DDH solver. So, now before proceeding further let us try to understand what is happening in this overall reduction. If you see here that if this triplet is a non DDH triplet that means this k is some g to the power gamma where gamma is not related to alpha beta then the distribution of the cipher text c1 comma c2 which is given to this attacker against the Elgamal scheme has exactly the same distribution as if this attacker would have participated in the COA game against the symmetric key variant of the Elgamal encryption scheme because that is how this challenge cipher text would look like for the attacker in that experiment. Whereas, if the triplet that is given to this DDH solver is a DH triplet then the distribution of C1 comma C2 that this adversary is seeing has exactly the same distribution as if this adversary would have seen by participating in an instance of COA game against the Elgamal encryption process. Right? So, we will come back to that fact again. So, now this adversary is has to identify whether it has seen an encryption of m0 or m1. So, it submits its output b dash and a response from the DDH solver is it says that it is seeing a DH triplet if and only if the adversary A sub E g has correctly identified whether it is m0 or whether it is m1 which is encrypted in the challenge cipher text c1 comma c2. So, now let us analyze the advantage with how much probability this DDH solver is going to solve the n instance a random instance of the DDH problem. So, I claim that if little b is equal to 0 that means this triplet is a non DDH triplet then the probability that my DDH solver outputs incorrectly namely it outputs b dash equal to 1 is exactly the same with which this COA attacker would have won the COA game against the symmetric key variant of the Elgamal encryption scheme and we have already proved that it is 1 by 2. And this is because the case if we are in the setting where little b is equal to 0 then as I have already proved that the cipher text which our adversary A sub e g is seeing has exactly the same distribution as it would have seen by participating in an instance of COA game against the modified Elgamal encryption scheme. On the other hand I claim that uh, if I am if my case is little b is equal to 1 then the probability that my DDH solver outputs b dash equal to 1 is exactly the same that my this adversary A sub e g wins the CPA COA game against the Elgamal encryption scheme and this follows from the fact that if we are in the case where little b is equal to 1 then means the triplet that is given is a DDH, DDH triplet or DFLMN triplet which means that the distribution of the cipher text which our adversary is seeing is exactly the same as distribution of the cipher text that this adversary is seeing is exactly the same as it would have seen by participating in an instance of COA game against the Elgamal encryption scheme. So, in summary what we have concluding what we are concluding now is that if we see the distinguishing advantage of our DDH solver then it is exactly 1 by 2 minus the probability with which our adversary could have won the COA game against the Elgamal encryption scheme. But since I am assuming that my DDH assumption holds in the underlying group then I know that the distinguishing advantage of any DDH solver is upper bounded by some negligible probability. That means if I reshuffle the terms I end up showing that the advantage of my adversary A sub e g in winning the COA game against the actual Elgamal encryption scheme is half plus negligible and hence my Elgamal encryption scheme is indeed COA secure. So, now let us discuss some of the implementation issues which we face when we implement Elgamal encryption squashes. So, first thing here is that uh, sharing public parameters in the context of Elgamal encryption scheme is safe. What I mean by that is if you see each instantiation of the Elgamal encryption process requires the description of a cyclic group, its generator, group operation and so on. So, by sharing public parameters I mean that multiple receivers can use the same description of the group, the same generator and so on. But the only difference is that each of them 
working on its own public key and secret key. That means, if we have a scenario where say we have 3 receivers R1, R2, R3 then instead of using different cyclic groups, we all the 3 receivers can operate on the same group of course, by using different public key and secret key. And this is a very remarkable feature with respect to Elgamal encryption process because later on when we will discuss RSA public key encryption scheme uh, in the context of RSA public encryption scheme sharing public parameters that means say the modulus, the, uh, the exact group on which we are performing the group operation and so on is quite can lead to insecurity. Now, the second concern here is that the DFA, the Elgamal encryption scheme that we have discussed is in the discussed with respect to an abstract cyclic group, but when we are implementing it we have to select a group over which we are go actually going to perform the operations. So, the candidate groups which we are use which we use in practice to instantiate the Elgamal encryption process are as follows. We can either use the group based on the points on elliptic curves modulo or prime or we can use the multiplicative subgroup a prime order multiplicative subgroup of the group ZP star. So, these are two of the popular groups where we use which we use for instantiating the Elgamal encryption process because we believe that DDH problem is indeed hard in both these candidate groups. The third issue here is the message space. So, if you see the description of the Elgamal encryption process the message space is nothing but the group element, but in real world application I would like to encrypt messages which are bit strings. So, the we have now some kind of incompatibility. My actual plain text is a bit string whereas, my encryption process supports uh, elements of groups to be encrypted. So, I can remove this incompatibility in either of the two ways. The option one is we can use some kind of reversible encoding to map bit strings to group elements and vice versa. So, this is one way to remove the incompatibility. Uh, but this is not preferred. The second option to get rid of this incompatibility is to use Elgamal encryption process as a part of hybrid encryption scheme. And what I mean by hybrid encryption scheme is that we use the Elgamal encryption scheme just to encrypt a random group element from the sender to the receiver. And then we apply a key derivation function on that encrypted uh, group element because the same group element will be now decrypted by the receiver and that common group element can serve as a common key for the sender and the receiver. Now, to derive a bit string as a key from that agreed upon group element both sender and receiver can apply a key derivation function and once a key derivation function is applied they both of them receive a common bit string as a key which can be now used as a key for a symmetric key encryption process. So, that is what I mean by a hybrid encryption process because it is a combination of both public key and symmetric key primitive. And it will turn out that for most of the public key crypto systems that we are going to discuss this we will face this compatibility issue again and again and a popular way option to deal with this incompatibility issue is to go for this option to namely use that public key encryption process as a part of hybrid encryption process. So, we will touch upon these details in our subsequent discussions. So, now let me end this lecture with a very interesting feature of the Elgamal encryption process by showing that it is multiplicative homomorphic. So, I am recalling retaining the description of the Elgamal encryption process and for simplicity again I am assuming that my underlying group operation is the multiplication operation say multiplication modulo p operation. So, imagine I am given with an encryption of some unknown plain text m. So, I do not know the encryption I do not know the plain text m, but I know the public key and I have an Elgamal's encryption of that unknown plain text m which consists of two group elements which I am denoting by c sub m 1 comma 1 and c sub m comma 2. And as per the syntax of the Elgamal encryption process C m will have this property. So, beta 1 is the underlying randomness used by the sender. And in the same way imagine that I have an Elgamal encryption a ciphertext of an unknown message m dash again consisting of two group elements right. Now, suppose I multiply the first component of both the ciphertext and independently I multiply the second component of both the ciphertext and this will produce two group elements which will mathematically have the following property. The first group element will be nothing but g to the power randomness used in the first cipher text plus the randomness used in the second cipher text and the second component will be the product of the actual two plain text multiplied by g to the power public key times the summation of the two randomness 
and if you look closely this is nothing but you can imagine as if this is an Elgamal cipher text for the plain text m dot m dash under the randomness beta 1 plus beta 2. And that is why I say that my Elgamal encryption process is multiplicative homomorphic. The reason it is multiplicative homomorphic is that if I multiply two Elgamal cipher text then even without knowing the underlying plain text I stress I do not know the underlying plain text and the underlying randomness beta 1 and beta 2 which are used independent individually even without knowing the underlying plain text and underlying randomness I end up getting an Elgamal cipher text of a related plain text namely m times m dash under some unknown randomness namely beta 1 plus beta dash. So, this is kind of a very interesting property of Elgamal encryption process and later on when we will discuss the CCA security of public key encryption process namely Elgamal encryption process we will come back and take this property again. So, that brings me to the end of this lecture. Uh, in this lecture we have seen a candidate uh, CPA secure public key encryption process namely Elgamal encryption process. Thank you.